وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to a new episode of Inspirations As I said and as you all know that the first Saturday of every month we will have a live episode This one is recorded, is already recorded Next week insha'Allah we will have uh, an, a live episode So we will be waiting for your phone calls so do call in have your say and let's hear from you what you think about this show how we can improve it what new ideas we can introduce to it inshallah in order to enhance and increase the benefit uh, still as well you can write to us on our email address inspirations at huda.tv this is again inspirations at huda.tv now last week we closed talking about the social life in the Arabian Peninsula, especially in Mecca. Then we were going to talk about the moral situation, the moral life, the moral values of the Arabs, and uh, how important that was to us to date in order to understand the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, and to understand as well why Allah chose the message of Islam, the final message, to be there among the Arabs first so that it spreads to the world what, uh, to the world what's the wisdom behind that we'll try inshallah to find out today and there's another aspect we will talk about as well which is very important the concept of jahiliya what's the meaning of jahiliya we'll try to find out we'll try to see what it means jahiliya what are the elements of jahiliya and why some orientalists have interpreted it in a certain way that really casts some doubt on the authenticity of the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Let's start with talking about the moral system or the moral values of the Arabs just before the birth and during that time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The first thing we can talk about actually is the concept of bravery. Now the Arabs, most of them were brave. They were known for their bravery. They never feared death. A person would put his uh, himself to, to death just for the sake of defense of the reputation and the dignity of his tribe or of his household. So the Arabs never feared death. They were very brave knights and warriors and that was very well known among all nations as well. So another thing was very well known among the Arabs was generosity. They were very generous. An Arab would even you know, deprive himself and his family of food just for the sake of feeding the guest. Just for the sake of feeding others who are poor, people who cannot provide food for their own families. So generosity was very well known among the Arabs and it was a sign of uh, nobility, a sign of dignity. So people would boast about their generosity. They would actually, actually go to extremes in terms of their generosity in order to gain this honor and to gain uh, this dignity and this reputation among others. So this is one aspect as well of the Arabs and it explains why Allah chose the message to be sent at that time to start among the Arabs because they would dedicate their lives totally for the sake of that message because they had this sense of dedication for noble things, for good things. Although they were immersed in some decadent and uh, evil things but still they had this nature of uh, 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 devoting their lives totally for the sake of the values they believed in, like generosity and like bravery and like loyalty to the tribe as well. Another aspect was uh, their truthfulness. An Arab, well, it was a shame for an Arab to lie. So they always avoided to tell lies, even if, if it caused them to die. And we know this from the story of Abu Sufyan before embracing Islam. He went and he met the uh, Byzantine emperor, uh, emperor. And when 
uh, the Byzantine emperor heard about the Prophet, about Muhammad وسلم, he asked Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan at that time uh, wasn't a Muslim. He, he was opposing Islam. So when the emperor asked him about that Prophet, uh, you know, what about his lineage? What about his genealogy? Does he come from a noble origin? Now Abu Sufyan was relating this and he said, because I feared that the people would notice or people would say that Abu Sufyan told a lie. I would have said that Muhammad doesn't come from a noble origin. But he said, I was compelled to admit that he comes from a noble origin. Why? Because I didn't want my people to see that I was lying. So it was a big shame for an Arab to lie. Now this as well explains why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to send the message in their lands uh, to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa specifically at that time. Because their truthfulness would help propagate the message and spread it to the world. And this was exactly what happened afterwards. And uh, a Muslim or an Arab would hold his word, would never break his word. When he gives a promise, that's it. Even if it, if it means death, an Arab would maintain his promise and keep his word. Now that was a very good characteristic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, meant to be there for the sake of the spread, the spread of Islam. Another aspect was the patience. We know that the Arabian Peninsula is desert. And the Arabs lived under very hard conditions, weather, poverty, desert, heat, and lack of resources, lack of water, lack of vegetation. And even w w until today, the people suffer from the hard uh, conditions, climate of that area. W along with the, uh, you know, the luxuries of this life, the means of transport, still it's very hard to live in that, these areas. It's very hard to travel. So the Arabs were very tough people. They were very patient. They, they could actually endure hard circumstances because of the tough nature of their life, the tough nature of their surroundings, of their uh, inhabitant, of, their, uh, of the environment in which they lived. So that caused them a lot of patience, a lot of persistence. And that was very necessary at the beginning of Islam to carry this message of Islam, to be very persistent and to be determined to spread it despite all the challenges and all the obstacles. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put these characteristics in the Arabs and Allah meant them to be there at that time to, in order to support Islam and spread this message to the world. Now this was the generally the moral situation among the Arabs. Now what can we say about this? We know that Islam came with the concept of jahiliyyah. Jahiliyyah actually refers to the state in which the Arabs were an example of just before Islam. The concept of Jahiliyyah means first polytheism. Second means uh, lack of good manners. Third means backwardness in terms of morality, in terms of manners. And it means as well the worship of idols. It means as well lack of knowledge. Knowledge of whom? Knowledge of the creator of the heavens and the earth. These are the main aspects. And wrong practices as well are included like uh, adultery, like uh, murdering or burying their daughters alive, uh, injustice, looting, uh, robbery, all these are included in Jahiliya. So every negative uh, human behavior is included within the umbrella or under the umbrella of Jahiliya. But the main concept is of, uh, of Jahiliya is ignorance of the Creator, of Allah and His rights, and uh, associating partners along with him which is shirk and polytheism these are the main origins and the main base or the basic meanings of jahiliya now how did the orientalists interpret jahiliya most of them translate the word jahiliya as ignorance now this is a mistake that even muslim translators have to figure out and they have to avoid so whenever you read that jahiliya is translated or rendered into english as ignorance then you have to know that this is a deficient translation or rendering or rendition because jahiliya is more extensive than this meaning and limiting the concept of jahiliya to ignorance is actually a grave mistake that was done first by the orientalists now Goldziher, uh, Gold the uh, German orientalist uh, pointed out that jahiliya which is taken from the word jahl jahl in Arabic is the antonym or is the opposite 
of two words either ilm which is knowledge or is the opposite of hilm which is easy to be easy going to be mild and soft and uh, and wise so this is uh, the word jahl in arabic is the opposite of these two words it's an antonym of ignorance and is an antonym uh, or is an antonym of uh, knowledge and is an antonym of uh, wisdom and to be easy going so Goldsey have pointed out that jahiliya is the opposite not of ignorance but of wisdom and good character mild character but still this kind of notion is not totally correct because jahiliya is the opposite of both knowledge and of sound and good character so jahiliya is the co a comprehensive meaning so this is this is actually called the other orientalists to fall into grave mistakes when talk when talking about uh, the concept of jahiliya because they tended to define jahiliya as a period for example nicholson the orientalist nicholson he uh, classifies the history of the arabs into three stages he says the first stage is uh, the stage of the uh, Sabianism or sa uh, the Saba, the, which is the civilization of Saba and Himyar in Yemen, because these were learned civilizations. They had culture, they had a civilization, they had knowledge. So it says this was the first stage. Then the second stage was the stage from uh, 500 CE to 622 CE. That was about 120 years before the advent of Islam. He says, he defines this as the Jahiliya period. And then he says, comes the Muhammadan period, which was the advent of Islam and onwards. So this classification is totally false because Jahiliya is not a period. And this was his mistake. He was followed also by another Orientalist, uh, Hitti. Hitti, the Orientalist, Hitti is a very well-known uh, historian and Orientalist. He said that the, uh, the history of the Arabs can be divided into three uh, stages, almost echoing Nicholson, the type of the sabio uh, Himyarite era, and then the era of Jahiliya or ignorance, then the Islamic period or Islamic era of the history of the Arabs. Now, their mistake was to define Jahiliya to a period of time and this is totally wrong because in Islam Jahiliya refers to everything that is associated with ignorance of the Creator with polytheism with low morality and with the wrong practices that we know that are opposite to Islam so Jahiliya and this is this was the approach of the Muslim scholars whenever they define Jahiliya it was a state it was a morality, it was a state of behavior, a state of, it was a mentality, it was a code of behavior. This is what uh, uh, Jahiliya refers to. And this is evident in the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, when one of the companions said to Bilal, may Allah be pleased with them all, he said, you are the son of the black woman. So he showed some kind of racism, some kind of uh, prejudice against that person some kind of discrimination so that when the Prophet ﷺ came to know about this he said to him you are a person in you there is jahiliya in your mentality there is jahiliya so jahiliya was over as a period at that time according to Hitti and Nicholson so jahiliya actually refers to a state of mind a state of affairs a mentality an attitude this is what jahiliya refers to and we explained the components of Jahiliya. So please note this because it is very important to understand the reality of this concept Jahiliya because failing to understand it will actually uh, make Islam look just as a natural evolutionary kind of stage after Jahiliya. But it is not because the goal and the main objective of the Orientalists was in fact actually to uh, show that Islam has no divine origin, that it was the uh, it was manufactured, it was designed, it was made by Muhammad himself as a human effort and as a natural sequence to the stage of what they call Jahiliya, the pre-Islamic period where we say no, Jahiliya actually stands for a state of mind, stands for a culture, stands for 
a civilization that does not acknowledge the Creator, does not know the rights of the Creator, and does not fulfill them, and does not adhere to the morality of Al Islam. This fact has to be very clear. So, even until today, now we can arrive at the conclusion even until today there is Jahiliyyah. Even if there is a civilization that possesses all the technology, all the material advancement in the, of this that have been yielded by the scientific uh, advancement and uh, uh, all this revolution in terms of science and technology and industry, if these people do not acknowledge the Creator and His rights, they do not acknowledge Allah and they do not know the rights of Allah and they still live for other than Allah and their main goal in this life is just to fulfill their carnal desires now this is, this is actually jahiliyyah. This is a state of jahiliyyah. And alhamdulillah, I, I've seen that, I've noticed that in Western countries, for example, the Muslims say when a person embraces Islam and he talks about himself in the past, he says, at times of jahiliyyah. This is a proper understanding of the word. So jahiliyyah is not limited to a period or a historical period. No, it is jahiliyyah is a state of mind, is a state of belief, is a state of failing to believe in the creator of the heavens and the earth, failing to believe in Al-Islam. So if a nation does not believe in Al-Islam, then it lives in a state of jahiliyyah. I hope that this becomes clear, because what the Orientalists actually want to prove is that jahiliyyah was one stage, okay, and it doesn't exist anymore. And Islam was just an, a natural kind of sequence or growth from the state in which the Arabs were living in before Islam. So hopefully this will become clear. Inshallah, we'll talk about more application, uh, application on the importance of understanding the true concept of jahiliyyah after we have this short break. So stay tuned. It's just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. What time in the life of Holy Prophet, Salah was ordained by Almighty? And what are the achievements of Shabib Miraj? These two questions I think are related. Was a beloved Prophet ordained to offer Salah? And what is the significance of Miraj in connection with Salah? Brother, exact date, day, like how we know when he died, when he was born, we don't know. But it was towards the early part of his prophethood. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You are still watching Inspirations and we are still dealing with the concept of jahiliyyah and the importance of understanding it uh, as it is from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we will discuss now inshallah some of the implications of failing to understand the correct meaning of the term Jahiliya. But I will remind you first of our email address so you can write to us. Uh, our email address is inspirations at huda.tv. Again, this is inspiration, inspirations at huda.tv. And I will remind you, inshallah, that next week we will have a live episode. So you can uh, call in, inshallah, and the numbers will appear as well on the screen. Do call us and uh, let us hear from you what suggestions you have, what things you really believe that we maybe have to add to the show or maybe some things that we can benefit from uh, benefit from what you say and uh, inshallah your contributions will be appreciated now talking about the concept of jahiliya as i said the orientalists uh, place their emphasis on the fact or it's not the fact actually it is a fallacy that jahiliya refers to a period of time that was about that is about a hundred all the period extending for about 122 years before the advent of Islam, before the revelation of the Qur'an. Now, by this, they want to claim, and they want to pave the way to claim that, for example, other Arab and non-Arab civilizations were not living in a state of ignorance or a state of jahiliyyah. This is one of the main goals. For example, they say the Arab civilizations in South in Yemen, in the south of the Arabian Peninsula, were not jahiliya because they knew how to read and write and they were literate and they were learned people. But according to the meaning of jahiliya in Islam, these people were living in jahiliya. So this is a Quranic concept. 
We cannot understanding according, understand it according to how the Orientalists or how Nicholson or Hitti wants it to be or how Gulziha wants it to be seen. On the contrary, we understand it as Allah applied it in the Quran and as the Prophet وسلم, applied it during his lifetime. So this is how we understand the concept of Jahiliyyah. So even until today, there are so many nations living in Jahiliyyah. At the time of the Prophet وسلم, there were so many nations and people living in a state of Jahiliyyah. And even before that, and even the thing is, at the time of Ibrahim and the people who followed him, that was not a state of Jahiliyyah. The people who followed Moses, peace be upon him, they were not in a state of Jahiliyyah. The people who followed Jesus, peace be upon him, were not in a state of Jahiliyyah. Any prophet and his followers were not living in a state of Jahiliyyah. I hope that this becomes clear so we understand what Jahiliyyah really means. So we don't fall in these misconceptions, intended and uh, planned uh, misconceptions that are made and manufactured by these Orientalists. Now, we're getting closer to talk about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I uh, promise you inshallah, next week we will start delving into the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this hopefully uh, should be the beginning and the start of talking about this wonderful person getting more attached to him, to learn more about his life, more about his upbringing, more about this wonderful character. Just let's talk about, give some historical background on Mecca specifically, and the, grand, and the forefathers of Muhammad wasallam. How did the situation there evolve until it became as it was at the time before the arrival of Islam? Now the fourth grandfather of Muhammad wasallam, in uh, his line of lineage or genealogy, was named Qusay. Qusay was a very wonderful man. Now, Qusay was brought up in a sham, in natural Syria, along with his maternal uncles. Now, until he, when he became, when he grew up, became a grown-up man, he came back to Mecca, to the land of his forefathers, the land of his fathers, and uh, he lived among them, and he got married from there. Then, when he realized that actually, Khuza'a was ruling over Mecca there, and they abused the pilgrims, and they manipulated the people, and they took more money, they took their money as well. So they exploited their control over Mecca. Qusay decided to put an end to this, and he decided to bring the control over Mecca back to the children of Ismail. And it is their right, in fact, to rule over Mecca, because they are the descendants of Ismail, they are the descendants of Ibrahim, and those are the ones who built the Kaaba, and Allah entrusted them with establishing the religion of Islam. So Qusay, with the help of some tribes, managed to push Khuza'a away from Mecca and to overtake control over Mecca. So the first thing he did was actually to bring the people of Quraysh, bring them to live closer to Al Kaaba because they used to live just outside or on the outskirts of Mecca. So he brought them to live near the Kaaba. He established what is called Darun Nadwa. Darun Nadwa was some kind of administration or some kind of a parliament, we can say, that run the affairs of Mecca. Uh, then he held actually four uh, or five uh, duties that are due, considered to be duties of honor. The first one was a siqaya. They, all, they were all related to Mecca and to pilgrimage. A siqaya was to provide the pilgrims with water. So he would provide them with water in Mecca, in Al Muzdalifa, in, uh, in Arafat as well, and in the different regions as well in where there were pil uh, rituals of pilgrimage. Uh, another duty. Uh, noble duty was Al Rifada. Al Rifada as well was to provide the pilgrims with food. So he provided food from his own money, provided the pilgrims with food, and that was out of the generosity of the people of Quraysh. And there was Al Hijaba. Al Hijaba was to look after the affairs and, uh, and to hold the keys of the Kaaba. That was uh, another aspect of another duty that Qusay held for himself. And uh, there was the uh, duty or the position of al liwa which is the flag of war or the banner for war. So it was basically like the defense ministry. He held that position himself. And there was Darul Nadwa, which is the parliament or the administration of Mecca. And Qusay held that with the help of his sons. He had f five sons. And after his death, 
uh, Qusay entrusted all these duties to his eldest son Abduddar. Abduddar maintained that, but the, his other children also wanted actually to shoulder some of these responsibilities. But they were all with Abduddar until Abduddar died. The, his, the grandsons of uh, Qusay, who were the children of Abduddar, the children of Abdu Manaf, and other sons, they always wanted to possess or wanted to have some of these duties, some of these privileges. Why were they deprived of that? So there was some kind of dispute and was actually reached the, uh, the brink of a war, of establishing a war. But uh, later on they had this treaty and they accepted to split these uh, duties among themselves. So the sons of Abdu Manaf uh, received two duties. They were a rifada and a siqaya. A rifada was to provide the pilgrims with food and to provide, to provide them with water which is a siqaya and they maintain that and it is it is still with their descendants until today until today the, their descendants have this privilege so the children of Abdu Manaf had these two uh, duties which was a siqaya and a, rifa, a rifada providing water and providing food for the pilgrims now uh, the children of Abdu Manaf, the most prominent of them was Hashim. Hashim was the third grandfather of the Prophet And we know the city of Gaza, uh, of Gaza in Palestine today, is actually named after uh, Hashim. It's called Gaza to Hashim, the Gaza of Hashim. Now Hashim was one of the forefathers of the Prophet Wasallam. Hashim was on a journey to Palestine because he was a tradesman, he was a merchant. So he was traveling to Asham, to Syria, to Palestine specifically. And on his way, he stopped in Al Madina. In Al Madina, he married a woman from the tribe of Bani Najjar. He married one of their daughters. And then he stayed for a couple of months, then he continued his journey to Palestine. Now, in Palestine, he caught a disease and he died there. His wife in, Med in Medina was pregnant and then she gave birth to a child whom she called Shayba. Now this child was brought up by his uh, maternal uncles and by his mother and until he reached the age of puberty his uncle Al-Muttalib who is the brother of Hashim heard of him. So he decided to go and bring him to Mecca so he can inherit the privilege and the position of his father which was to provide the, pilgrim, uh, the pilgrims with food and water and that was considered to be a high position among the Arabs so out of his generosity, out of his loyalty to his brother this Al-Muttalib, he went to bring his nephew from al Madina. so he went and he spoke to his mother, he said listen your son has a high privilege and he, ca he should inherit that privilege that belonged to his father. So I want him to come to Mecca so he takes his due position, he takes the noble position that he deserves among in his tribe. And that was the case she accepted and Shayba went with his uncle Al-Muttalib. Now when the people saw Al-Muttalib coming back to Mecca along with this young man, they thought he was a slave. He thought he bought a new slave, uh, that young boy. So they, they said this is the slave of Al-Muttalib. So this is why he got the nickname of Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, that was the grandfather of the Prophet So Shayba came to be known as Abdul Muttalib. So he inherited the privilege of his father and he became very respected, very extremely respected among his people because he became a very wise man when he grew up and a brave man and he actually started to grow to uh, be called the chief of the tribe of Quraysh or the chief of Mecca so he had this privilege and this respect the people held him in high esteem and actually some historians believe that Abdul Muttalib believed in the religion of Ibrahim he did not worship idols on the contrary he worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone there were some com conflicting reports regarding that but it seems that he was a Hanif he was upon the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam now this, uh, let's move to talk about uh, Abdul Muttalib. He had so many beautiful stories, and these happened before the birth of the Prophet. 
Now, Abdul Muttalib uh, had, after he got married, he had one son. That son was called Al Harith, his eldest son, and only son at that time. Now, when Abdul Muttalib started to have this noble and very high position among the tribe of Quraysh, one day he was sleeping near Al Kaaba, and he saw a vision, or he heard a voice saying to him, Go and dig out that which is good. For three consecutive nights, he had the same dream telling him to dig out that g beautiful well. And he realized it was, uh, it was Zamzam. At the third night, that voice informed Abdul Muttalib of that place of the well. So he took his son, Al Harith, and he went to that place which was just near the idols of Isaf and Nailah, those idols. So he started digging out, and when he saw the water gushing forth, he said, Allahu Akbar. He knew that it was the well of Zamzam, the well of Ismail alayhi salam. It shows now and indicates that the Arabs knew their history. They knew that there was a well called Zamzam, and it was the well of Ismail, and they knew the religion of Ismail, peace be upon him. And this actually refutes what the Orientalists, such as Mawar says, that Islam or the Arabs were polytheists and they had no connection to Ibrahim and Ibrahim, Ibrahim never came to Mecca and he never built the Kaaba. All these are refuted by the well-established historical narrations that are very well known to the Arabs at that time. So actually when I read these words of some of these Orientalists like Mawar, when he denies that Ibrahim was in Mecca, when he denied, when he denied that Ibrahim built, ever built the Kaaba or that Ismail ever lived in Mecca, I really wonder what kind of objectivity these people claim to have. They always claim objectivity to themselves. They talk about scholarship in all these famous universities, when they, especially when it comes to Oriental and Eastern studies and African studies. Where is objectivity? Honestly, when you read their books, if you are aware of the Islamic history, if you are aware of what the Quran says and what the uh, narrations from the Ar Arab historians say, and you read the way these people deal with history, you cannot give them the benefit of the doubt because you see purposeful distortion of history. They want to distort history. For what for? For, their, for certain motives, certain objectives that they have. So when they, and now from now on, really after reading their books and reading what they had to say about the history of Islam and the history of the Arabs, I no longer believe in what they call objectivity or in the scholarship of these universities, universities, even if it be Cambridge, even if it be uh, Oxford, even if it be whatever university or, or, or Harvard University, these people, they are distorting history for their own ulterior motives. And I'm saying this without any hesitation because I know what I'm talking about. Read the, their books and you will not find objectivity. You can tell their goal is to distort history. Their goal is to manipulate their own people who don't know anything about Islam. They want to create a first impression, they want to make a reference point, which we talked about, so that they instill in the hearts of the people that Islam is not the true message. So where is honesty? Where is objectivity? Where is scholarship? I can't find it in their words. And you can read for yourself and find out for yourself. And you can do that. The books are available and the Islamic sources and the Arab sources on history are available. So you can read them and find out for yourself. Now, what happened to Abdul Muttalib when he, after he dug out the well of Zamzam? Inshallah, we will find out after having a short break. So stay with us. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. We said in the previous episode that olive oil olive leaves and olive tree bless us with their blessing and what they contain like the green color and chlorophyll. We have started to talk about the benefits of chlorophyll to the body and its usages and how we use it in treating lung fibrosis, in treating heart failure, treating pyromania, in facilitating delivery in addition to treating indigestion and treating anemia and many other diseases. Is just Allah's way 
to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations. Before the break, I was talking about the issue of objectivity and the issue of scholarship, especially in the writings of uh, Orientalists. The thing is that I've been recently very much immersed, I can say, in their books and their writings and some of the refutations against them. It's just amazing. Something I was just wondering how could some people, a whole body of people, a whole institution of uh, so-called scholars really claim scholarship and claim authenticity and claim objectivity. Then if you read their books, you will notice that it's very apparent, it's very clear. When they talk about history, especially Islamic history, when they talk about the person of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa now they have historic, historical reports that are very clear, that are very decisive and definitive. But then they come with something opposite, they come with their own c conclusions and you can find quite often in their books, it seems to be that this and that happened. Well, I think that maybe this was the, th maybe this was the case. You don't find anything certain. All what you find, it seems to be, maybe we can get to the conclusion, we can deduce from that. So there is nothing decisive. While well, they have facts, at hand. They have it in the Quran, they have it in the Sunnah, they have it from the Muslim historians, they have it from the Arab, Arab historians, but they don't accept that. Now this is prejudice, this is not scholarship. When you stop picking and choosing from certain sources and you neglect totally authentic sources, now this has nothing to do with scholarship, this has nothing to do with objectivity. And on what basis you accept some kind of narrations from unknown historians, from historians who have no records, whose, actually, whose reports have been uh, uh, verbally narrated through thousands of years and you take them as well-established facts, then when it comes to the Qur'an and the Sunnah that have been recorded according to a very meticulous way that has no parallel, parallel in human history, then you, you depend on the, the historical narration and you leave the authentic facts because it suits the impression you want to create and I really invite you to read some of their books and you will notice the mo most of the time they say it seems to be maybe or it would have been the case or we can conclude from this and that it's uncertain but there is this and that so there is no certainty I don't know how you know so many Muslims have been fooled in order to believe that these people really have scholarship. And from here I call on Muslims. Anyone, any, any Muslim who is really in a, the academ academic field, who can, has access to these books, and who is qualified to really expose the lies of these people, you have, it's an obligation on you Islamically to defend Islam and show the lies of these people. You don't have to, you know, because you don't have really to trace every lie they make, because that would really waste a the efforts of a whole generation. What you have to do is bring the Islamic sources to light, present our story to the world. And from here as well, I call on non-Muslims. Maybe there's a, uh, there's a strategy called renting out your mind. And this is very prevalent in the West. They, they only take from, from their own writers. They consider certain people to be authorities on Islam and Islamic history. They only take from them. These people are lying to you. These people are fooling you. These people are controlling your destiny by controlling your, your mind. Allah has given you this, this gift of reason, this gift of a brain with which you can scrutinize, with which you can analyze, with which you can search and find the truth. Do that yourself. Find out for yourself. Read in the Quran. Read the traditions of Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Find out about Islam for yourself. Find out from the Muslim authorities. I don't know where objectivity comes from when Orientalists reject the Quran as a source of information and they reject the Sunnah and they reject all the Muslim historians. On what basis? This is not objectivity. Then they accept the narrations that have no authenticity whatsoever. It's unbelievable. Inshallah, we will talk more in the future about their lies, about their distorted methodology that they claim to be scholarly. And we will expose the defects 
and the ulterior motives behind all of this strategy insha'Allah and we will talk about the techniques that they use in order to manipulate and control the minds of the people in the West they do that on purpose and they have goals behind that and insha'Allah we will try to expose that and I hope that once you come across anything like that you inform us about it you can write to us or you can uh, uh, call us in inshallah during the live show and we will uh, uh, take that so now Abdul Muttalib we were talking just before the break about him having a vision then he dug out the well of Zamzam now he said Allahu Akbar when he noticed that he realized that was the well of Ismail which is the well of Zamzam he had only one son at that time that was Al-Harith who helped him to dig out the well of Zamzam. When Quraysh realized that it was the well of Zamzam, Zamzam, they said to him, this is the well of our father, Ismail. So we have a right. As you have a right, we have a right as well to have a share in this well. So it shows now as well that the Arabs knew their history. They could trace back their genealogy, their lineage back to Ismail. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. So Abdul Muttalib said to them, no, I've been favored over you. I've seen this vision, so, so I am meant, I am meant to have this well and to have control over it. So I'm not going to share it with you. You have to understand this fact. They did not accept this. They said, no, Try, find a referee who will judge between us. Uh, Abdul Muttalib, after discussing the issue with them, they decided to go to one fortune teller that was in the north of the Arabian Peninsula they had to travel in order to get to that area so they set out and on the way when they were traveling in the middle of the desert the water ran out from Abdul Muttalib and his people he went with his son and some of his relatives they ran out of water so they said to the other people of Quraysh can you give us some water they said we can't because we are in the, middle, in the middle of the desert and we might run out of water as well and die. So they left them for their own destiny. They didn't know what to do. In the middle of the desert, no water, no food. They didn't know what to do. And all that was for the sake of the well of Zamzam, having control. You see how the Arabs, they always were seeking after honor, even if it was a vanity, even if it was false honor. And they, uh, they were very persistent. So what happened actually, uh, Abdul Muttalib consulted those with him. They said, what do you think we should do? After thinking and deep think after deep thought, they decided, okay, let's you know, dig out our graves. And whenever a person of us dies, we will throw him in his ditch and then bury him. Because it was very shameful to the Arabs to die and for your body to remain just like that unburied so they said okay if one person remains that that's less an evil than all of us remaining on the surface like that and then we will decay we would decay or the beasts would prey on our bodies so they everyone digged a grave for himself then while sitting waiting for death Abdul Muttalib said why, why is this state of helplessness we should do something and if we die, okay, let's die while trying to find some water. We can't just sit like that, helpless, doing nothing, waiting for death to come to us. So this is what they did. They started riding their horses. Once they wanted to go, water gushed forth from the ground, from underneath uh, the horse of Abdul Muttalib, and it was water, a spring of water. They drank from that water. They gave to the other people of Quraysh. When Quraysh saw that, they said, listen, we don't have to go to the fortune teller. It seems that Allah wants you to have control over Zamzam. He's the one who gave you water in the middle of the desert. Okay, so uh, they said, okay, it's all yours. The well of Zamzam, we will not ask you for any share in it. This is a privilege that Allah has given exclusively to you. They went back to Mecca. Now when Abdul Muttalib noticed that uh, he really needed help, when Quraysh wanted to fight with him over the well of Zamzam, and he only had one son and he felt weak so he said he asked Allah to give him more children so he said oh Allah I give you a vow that if you give me ten sons I will slaughter one of them for your sake so after a long time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Abdul Muttalib ten children ten sons so when he had ten sons 
he had to, and he was compelled to fulfill his vow. So he decided to cast the lots among his children and see where it goes, where it decides to be slaughtered. So the most beloved to him among his children was Abdullah. Abdullah was the youngest and the most beloved to him. When they cast the lots, it pointed to Abdullah that he is the one to be slaughtered. Abdul Muttalib was puzzled. Should I slaughter my most beloved son Abdullah? And everyone actually loved uh, Abdullah seems to, to have had a beautiful and pleasant character. Everyone loved him. So he didn't know what to do. Should I slaughter my son? The most beloved, the, mo the closest, the dearest to me of my children. So he was, he was puzzled. He didn't know what to do. He was asking people, can you get me out of this, uh, out of this really uh, uh, calamity that I put myself in? I don't want to slaughter my son. But he made a vow. And the Arabs, that was part of the religion of Ibrahim. When they made a vow, they had to fulfill it. They couldn't uh, break that vow. Now, what, how did Abdul Muttalib get out of this vow, out of this critical situation? Inshallah, we will find out next week. Next week will be, inshallah, a live episode. So, do call in and we will be waiting for your comments and your suggestions and anything you have, you can add to the, country, to the uh, show, anything you can add to the subject, please, we would be very happy to receive that. Especially like last month, mashallah, may Allah reward you. Your contributions were wonderful, were uh, added a lot to the program. So, inshallah, next week we'll be expecting your phone calls and you can still write to us on our email, inspirations at huda.tv. So, next week, inshallah, we will get to know how did Abdul Muttalib get out of this tight spot? How did he, did he get himself out of this position? And we will know more about the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa his birth and his early life. So, until we meet next time, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us sincerity, to grant us his forgiveness and his blessings. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته